All right. So let's start this afternoon session. So we start with Tom Proctor from the University of Washington, who will tell us about the total lattice with random matrix initial data. Okay, thank you. I think the audio is working. Okay. So I want to thank the organizers and thank the Isaac Newton Institute. It's really nice that we actually get to make this finally happen. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the total lattice with random matrix initial data. Um, and the actual motivation for this was a numerical analysis problem. And, um, you know, we think of integrability, we think of isospectral flows, and that's naturally what occurs in eigenvalue algorithms. If you're trying to compute the eigenvalue of, eigenvalues of a matrix, you want to do successive transformations to diagonalize it, but not change the eigenvalues. So naturally, isospectral, isospectral uh, transformations come into numerical analysis, right? So I'll get more into that as we go. Okay, so the first part of this talk is joint with Percy Daft, uh, and then the second two parts are really joint with uh, Su Sai Ding at UC Davis. Um, and he really brought kind of the heavyweight new, uh, random matrix theory into this, um, which was extremely helpful. I learned a lot from him. Um, okay, so the first part, I'll talk about what we'll call the first deflation time uh, for the TOTA algorithm. And then, and we'll just apply that to the so-called class of Wigner matrices. Um, and then I will go through very briefly, I'd love to spend a lot more time on it, but a way to talk about perturbations of orthogonal polynomials using the Riemann-Hilbert framework. And then I'll use that to kind of think maybe more generally about TOTA on a wider class of uh, random matrices. Um, okay. So let's start back at the beginnings. So TOTA, as we all know, introduced the total lattice in 1967. Uh, here's the Hamiltonian. Of course, you then go to the uh, equations of motion. And right here, I mean, for us, it's going to be important that everything's finite. And right, you have to figure out, OK, with this nearest neighbor interaction, how do we determine what happens with the zeroth particle and the n plus first particle? OK, and so Flashka used periodic boundary conditions. And then you get these, you know, basically a tridiagonal matrix with some off-diagonal contributions. And OK, you do the usual change of variables that Flashka introduced. And you arrive at the Lax equation, right? We, you know, all familiar. Um, and this, of course, gives you an isospectral flow. Eigenvalues are preserved, but through the periodicity, kind of from a numerical analysis perspective or an eigenvalue computation perspective, nothing interesting happens. Your everything is kind of fluctuating from one boundary to the other, you don't get to a diagonal matrix, so you don't get any additional information about the eigenvalues. I think I, there we go. Right, this is really what I said. So we get a completely integrable system, an isospectral flow, but from my kind of target goal of understanding some numerical analysis problems, some eigenvalue computation problems, you don't really gain, you don't get there with the periodic total lattice. Okay, so that's where we go to Moser's work, where Moser basically introduced these formal boundary conditions, which in effect knock off the off diagonal term. And so now you have the same effective Lax equation, but now no periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so now what does this change? Well, the periodic total lattice, you actually have compact energy surfaces, so you have recurrence, you're not going to converge to any sort of fixed point. But with this one, and this is actually what Moser showed, is you get this difference generically tending to infinity, and that tells you that the off-diagonal entries are going to all converge to zero. Right? So in the long time, you have an isospectral flow that converges to a diagonal matrix. Right? So you compute the eigenvalues in essence with the long time behavior of the finite total lattice, finite non-periodic total lattice. Okay, and in general, these would be probably ordered in increasing order, depending on what your sign convention is, um, and generically, that's the case. 
Okay, so I'm going to enter a lot of this from using orthogonal polynomials. And where are orthogonal polynomials be, uh, behind the scenes here? Well, we have this tridiagonal matrix. And of course, anytime you see a symmetric tridiagonal matrix, there's orthogonal polynomials somewhere. And I'm going to eventually leverage this very, uh, I think it's just fascinating fact. And I guess if anybody has a earlier reference to this than this paper, I'd love to know about it. I, this is the, the earliest I found, but it might not be the right reference. Um, if so goes work. But, right, so we take a bounded uh, tridiagonal matrix, a bounded Jacobi operator, right? And we have a unique probability measure um, such that the orthogonal polynomials with respect to that measure give me back the Jacobi matrix through their three term recurrence coefficients. Okay? So then you take your measure that you got from your Jacobi matrix, you evolve it using a simple exponential time dependence. Now I think about, okay, I evolve in time, I compute my recurrence coefficients at some future time. Okay? Those now time dependent recurrence coefficients solve the total lattice. Right? So this gives us a way to work with the measure, evolve there and understand, if we can understand the map from orthogonal polynomials to recurrence coefficients, we can understand what's happening with the total lattice. Okay? Here's what I found. All right. Um, so this construction initially is motivated through tridiagonal matrices, but there's in principle no reason why you need to stop there. You can consider full symmetric matrices you just have to be a little bit careful with what you do in this part of the matrix commutator. You take the lower triangular part minus its transpose. Right? So now this gives you an isospectral flow on full symmetric matrices. And again, it will converge to a diagonal matrix and you can in principle use this as an eigenvalue algorithm. Okay. So by the TOTA algorithm, what I mean is integrating whether you want to think of it numerically or whether you want to think of it as solving it uh, exactly, integrating this flow to uh, until a time when it's appropriately diagonal. Okay. Right, and so this is really the paper that motivated a lot of this. And so the, the kind of the fundamental observation or I guess conjecture in this paper was you have an integrable system, the total lattice, you have Random matrix theory, maybe Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, Gaussian unitary ensemble, which is thought of as an integral probabilistic model. You put these two together, something interesting has to happen, right? And that was the kind of the motivation. Let's take integrable random matrix initial data for an integrable system. Okay, okay so how do you characterize the long time behavior? What are you going to look at to try to say this is this is the observable that characterizes the long time behavior. We have the limit, but from a numerical analysis perspective, it's how long does it take me to get there? How many iterations do I need until I get to my goal? And that's what we are gonna look at is what we call the first deflation time. Okay. So there's many different things you could consider, right? Um, the what I'll think about is this matrix that's evolving in time. We could block it. Here's the upper left, I guess, k by k principal minor. We have this off diagonal block, and then we have the remainder. And what you would do in a numerical analysis setting is you'd be running your algorithm. And if you ever observed that one of these off diagonal blocks was very small, you would split the problem into two sub problems and run on those, right? That's called deflation. Um, and so ideally, what you want to do is analyze this quantity, these TKs. So this is the uh, first time at which I observe this off diagonal block being small. Okay, and so the deflation time, the first deflation time is the minimum over all of those times. Okay, so that would be ideally what we would analyze because that's kind of the more maybe computationally relevant quantity. It's very hard. Right, this is a minimum, if you think about with random matrix initial data, this is the minimum over what n minus one correlated random variables. Right? It's a non-trivial task to analyze it. So in the end, what we're going to do is simplify our lives significantly and let k be one. 
Right, so we're just going to look at the time until all of the off-diagonal entries in the first row are small. And then the 1-1 one, one entry should be close to an eigenvalue. Okay. All right, and we, you, know, you could also look at something that is kind of much more ambitious, maybe, is the time until you're close to being fully diagonal, which would be also in terms of these quantities. OK. Right. OK. And what's going to happen is the algorithm is going to typically order the eigenvalues. And so this will be the time until the top, meaning the most positive eigenvalue, is computed to an accuracy of approximately epsilon. OK. So what's the setting? So I'm going to apply the TODA algorithm to random, ma random matrix initial data. I'll choose a generalized Wigner ensemble. So this has you know, kind of some, some technical conditions I'm going to hide. But you have mean 0, you have a variance condition, and then you have some sort of, well, you basically want to say that it's truly random in a sense. Right? Um, and then, OK, if you're looking at a complex matrix, you have to say it's truly complex. It's not actually degenerate or approximately a real matrix. Um, there's higher order moment conditions you need to push all this through. Um, it's, they're not really explicit conditions, they're just bounded in this condition. Okay, so we take sample a random matrix, symmetric, just think of it as a GUE matrix or GOE matrix, symmetric matrix with Gaussian entries. That's kind of the simplest setting to have in mind. Okay, so then we apply the TOTA algorithm to our random matrix H. We run the algorithm until the first deflation time, until we see that the sum of the squares of all of the off-diagonal entries in the first row are, is less than, I guess that would be less than epsilon squared. Um, and then the question is, this is now a random variable that indicates the runtime of the algorithm. And what is its distribution? What does it depend on as the matrix size goes to infinity? And that's kind of the, the, the fundamental question. I mean, that was really motivated by this work of uh, Mainon. Deft and Frang. Uh, okay. It will have to be, right? And actually, in the end, the punchline is you get very different things for different dependencies of epsilon on n, and what happens in between the two cases we can analyze. That will be kind of the, the takeaway. Um, okay. So, how do you do this? Well, you first start just doing simulations, right? These are an algorithm, so you would be remiss if you didn't just simulate the thing and see what it looks like. And so here, I think I have four different types of Wigner matrices, some with continuous densities for the entries, some with discrete densities for the entries, fairly large, I think it's about 500 by 500 matrix. And what do I do is I just run the simulation, compute my first deflation time, Subtract off the sample mean over about 10,000 samples, divide by the sample standard deviation. Right? And so then you put them all on the same curve, and you see that all these histograms for your run times are just matching up. Right? And then you, you believe that there's universality in the sense that I can vary the entries, entry distribution for the matrix H, and I'm going to roughly see the same histogram coming out. OK. Right? And so this is what we were able to show is, so first let's define this distribution function here, which is, so the way we've scaled things, the top two eigenvalues of these matrices are on the scale of, or their fluctuations are on the scale of n to the two thirds. So it turns out that's what you should rescale by. So this thing converges in distribution to something. And we'll just call that something uh, F beta gap, right, for simplicity, okay? And so what we basically were able to show is that, again, it, epsilon depends on n in an appropriate way. Um, I can say a little bit more about this, and I think this is suboptimal. Um, you rescale by the end of the two-thirds. There's another factor. I'll show you where this comes into play. But this quantity then converge, converges in distribution to the same thing that you get for the inverse of the top gap for the matrix. OK? And the important thing is this quantity is universal. It doesn't actually depend on the entry distribution of the matrix. So therefore, what we get out here doesn't depend on the entry distribution for the matrix. Right? So you take discrete entry, Bernoulli plus or minus one entries, or Gaussian entries, you're going to see roughly the same statistics for a large matrix for the runtime of the algorithm. 
And just to kind of see where this all comes from is you're really using kind of this exponential orthogonal polynomial stuff in the background. You can kind of see it here with the Dirac mass at the eigenvalues. You get the exponential time dependence. It's really coming in. And so this is an explicit formula for the sum of the off-diagonal entries in the first row. If you just say, OK, let's just send t to infinity, you get an expression like this. You set that to epsilon. You solve for t. And this is the expression you get. You kind of work with this. And this is actually turns out to be an order one quantity in the random setting. This turns out to be an order one quantity. OK, this is much larger. So then you drop the lower order terms. And then this is your heuristic. This is what should be happening. Right? And so then if I take this, I divide by the numerator. It converges to the inverse of the top term. OK. Yeah, this is just the first one. Yes. Yeah. And so we, we kind of have some idea about the other ones, but we haven't shown anything there. Yeah. OK. Um, right. So th there's a lot of technical issues here. You have a random sum. The number of terms in the sum is increasing. You have gaps that are shrinking. You have to control all these things. And so you have to use detailed estimates from random matrix theory to be able to, to make that heuristic actually go through. And you need to put yourself into the long time regime so that it's truly that top gap that is dominating. And that's why you need epsilon sufficiently small. I think this should be n to the minus 2 thirds, but we couldn't get it down to that. Okay. All right, but even with this, if epsilon is you know, just a little bit above machine precision, you're still looking at matrices of fairly large size. So this, I mean, OK, no one uses the TOTA algorithm to compute their eigenvalues. They use much more sophisticated things. But it still is in the practical realm of, of computations. right? You're in this kind of scaling regime for practical uh, computations. OK. So what, what is the main random matrix input? So it really comes down to these local laws. So this is this paper down here, uh, Erdos, Nows, Yao, and Yin from 2013. It was truly foundational paper in random matrix theory. It's, you know, basically changed a lot of how we understand and analyze these things. And really what we're kind of doing is figuring out a way to use that in maybe slightly more applied setting. Um, but what is the state? So here is the semi classical semicircle law which gives the limiting spectral distribution of a generalized Wigner matrix. Here is its Stilchi's transform, or up to a scaling, a Cauchy transform. The local law says that this quadratic form involving the resolvent is close to the semicircle law with the inner product of the vectors. Right, so if, if you just take V to be W, both unit vectors, then this just becomes a one. And you basically say this quadratic form is close to the, semi, the Stilchi's transform of the semicircle. Right? And then your error is like 1 over square root of n times the imaginary part of z. Okay. So you can actually shrink. So you have this resolvent quantity that's close to a Stilchi's transform of a deterministic quantity, this random thing. And you can actually use it as you approach the axis. Right? You, the classical semicircle law is basically at a fixed z, you have this kind of estimate. But this allows you to come down. OK? And this law implies much of, we don't use this specifically in this, this uh, work, previous work, but it implies these, quanti these things called uh, eigenvalue universality, which I already mentioned, eigenvalue rigidity, and eigenvector delocalization. And we need at least some consequences of those in the proof of the, the theorem I just presented. OK? And just to kind of convince you that this is actually happening, right? He, here are these histograms rescaled compared with the computed densities for this distribution function. And there's, so the beta equals 2 case, it's not too surprising that there's a Fredholm determinant representation. It's complicated. And so Folkmar computed this, and it took like I think 48 hours or something to compute that sufficiently number, sufficiently high number of points. So yeah, get the world's expert when you need help. Um, OK, so now let's use the local law, which gave us the tools to do the TOTA part. 
the, at least the first deflation time. Now let's use the local law to say something else about Toto. Okay, and so you know we're many of us in this audience are familiar with this. Some of us aren't, but you know I, I kind of have to jump into it given the time constraints. Okay, so here is the Fokas its Kataya Riemann Hilbert problem. We have the monic orthogonal polynomials and their Cauchy transforms. And this has a jump condition on the real axis and some asymptot prescribed asymptotics at infinity. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, there's a bit of an issue because we, we have a measure for the orthogonal polynomials that is really a discrete measure in the finite matrix case. And we have a limiting measure that's a continuous object. And how do we compare these two things? Well, we have to kind of deform off where we have the discreteness and do something in the complex plane. And so you can use the Cauchy transform, or this is really the Stilchy's transform of the measure, to then deform, this is really the same trick that Ken did, except I have potentially some continuous parts. And you move your poles and your densities off into the complex plane. Okay, and now I'm thinking of a situation where I have a deterministic limiting measure mu that I know a whole lot about, and I have a random measure nu that's gonna come from a random matrix ensemble, and I wanna compare these two things. And I wanna compare specifically the orthogonal polynomials uh, for these two measures. Okay, and so you look at basically, so you have this one you know a lot about, we can ignore this constant C. I mean, it's important, but we can talk about it later. Uh, so you take the ratio of your two matrices and you look at the Riemann-Hilbert problem it solves. And so the most important thing is, I think I highlighted it, yes. Um, you get this quantity coming out, identity plus this, and this is exactly the quantity that the local law estimates. The difference of the random, Stilchy's transform of a random measure and Stilchy's transform of its limit. Okay, so if this is, if n is sufficiently large in the matrix ensemble, you expect this to be small. And so then you should have a near identity jump and you should be able to be in business with the Riemann Hilbert theory. Okay, so I don't wanna, this is the full statement, but let's just highlight something specific about it. So I, I know a lot about mu, I wanna know something about nu, and it's connected through this X matrix. And I can get an expansion, at least here's the first two terms in the expansion of X. Um, so I know a lot about mu, so I know in principle what this is. This is gonna be my random quantity that the local law estimates. And to estimate this quantity, I, know, I need to know a ton about the polynomials for my limiting measure. And so how we've handled that is you then compute their asymptotics and you can control them and understand how they behave, right? So there's kind of a complicated step that requires regularity in mu and requires you to be, do an asymptotic calculation that's separate uh, to analyze and verify this condition. Okay, but the main thing, I'll just skip through, I'm kind of short on time, is right, your random polynomials look like your deterministic polynomials plus these two random functions. That's the kind of conclusion you get out of this, okay? And so this is kind of comparing one set of class of polynomials relative to another. Um, okay, so how do we actually employ this strategy into TOTA? Well, let's look at this quantity. We'll take a unit vector V. So this is the local law. And so then, okay, I look at this. This turns out to be, okay, the Stilchy's transform of some discrete measure where you have the projection of the vector V onto your different eigendirections, okay? And then we know, okay, if I'm gonna evolve this under TOTA, what this whole theory says is I should replace this mu with its limit plus some error term, right? And that comes from the Riemann-Hilbert theory because I can estimate the terms in the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So I can go, is that Riemann-Hilbert problem gives you a reconstruction formula for the three-term recurrence, and you push the errors through and figure out what they appear like on the other side. Okay? And there's some, I believe, suboptimal conditions on J and T. But we can actually look at the total lattice as you go down the lattice, as the matrix size increases, 
but we can't go all the way to the end. Okay. But, so okay, I, I, I ch showed you, okay, we take this measure, I can say the total lattice now looks like this limiting, like total lattice applied to three term recurrence associated with a limiting measure. Well, what's the initial data that I chose? And that connects back to a numerical analysis question. It really connects to the Lanchos algorithm, which is the tridiagonalization process for a symmetric matrix. So if I choose my initial data to be generated with H and V using the Lanchos iteration, which I don't have really time to explain, if I, if I generate my initial data with, by tridiagonalizing tri H using V in this Lanchos process, I get a tridiagonal matrix, use that as initial data for the total lattice, then this is exactly the evolution of the total. Right. And then I now know exactly what, how these, the large end limit of these quantities, what they look like. Okay, so this is kind of the summary of, of that then. Okay, so suppose we take an n by n uh, random matrix that satisfies a local law. It doesn't have to be semicircular. It could be something else. There's many other classes of matrices that have local laws. And you try diagonalize H using Lanchos with some starting vector. Often you would do this with the first unit vector. Um, then it actually corresponds to householder triangulization if you know about that. Okay, so you try to analyze your matrix. You put it into uh, initial condition for total lattice. You start letting n go to infinity, and you ask what, as I evolve time, what does my total lattice look like? Well, it looks like if you evolved coda with the limiting det deterministic measure, with the three-term recurrence associated with the limiting deterministic measure, plus these Aj's and Bj's, which you can prove have normal uh, fluctuations, converge to normal distributions. Okay. And so this is basically a paper where we went through all of this. We, we had kind of a view towards Krylov subspace methods, which use orthogonal polynomials as well. But it, you know, the TOTA problem also fits into the, into the category. Um, right, so for values of T and J that are not too large, the leading order behavior of the total lattice is deterministic, plus some Gaussian fluctuations. Right, and just to kind of give you an example of the different kinds of matrices that have local laws, and you could take then as random initial data for the total lattice, is so this is a sample covariance matrix. You take X to be, say, IID random, and you can put, put spikes. You can have different components for your, your limiting density, so you can do fairly exotic things. Um, okay, and so let me just end with something that actually links back to what Ken was saying in kind of an interesting way, is so if I let epsilon be v small in this way, my runtime of my algorithm looks like this, is basically the rescaled inverse of the top gap of the random matrix, which is a Tracy Widom statistic in a sense, and it's a very local statistic at the top edge, okay? But if I let epsilon be order one and compute the first halting time, it depends on this thing, which is the limiting tridiagonal matrix associated with the local law. That's basically to first order deterministic, right? And this is a global eigenvalue statistic. So epsilon order one, global dependence on the eigenvalues, epsilon sufficiently small local behavior dependence on the eigenvalues, what happens in between? So somewhere in between you have to transition from local to global statistics, and how does that happen? So that's kind of, we have no, no real idea about that, but that's kind of a uh, interesting, yeah, I think that's kind of the, one of the more interesting things that have come out of this, this work. So I think uh, that's all I have. So. Thank you very much, Hadi, any questions? Uh, so in the, in the the local eigenvalue statistic case, the first case, uh -huh. um, how, how much, if anything, do you think you could get by just considering the linearization of TOTA about the the fixed point, about the li you know the limit? Right. So okay, I, I mean, not sure how much. So I, what I can say is, when I first did this, the calculation I started with was 
linear ODE with the random matrix as my coefficient matrix. And that will then, you know, take the log of that, it behaves like the top eigenvalue. Right. And you analyze that first, and that basically told me all the tricks and the estimates I needed to then go to the nonlinear uh -huh. problem. Okay, because, yeah, the, gap, the gaps show up there as right, well. Right, right, okay. yeah. But there's extra terms, there's just a couple extra terms that you have to, they're not easy to estimate, but you can kind of remove them from the problem. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. So when, when you look at the total dynamics, you know, the eigenvalue is sort of the true asymptotic one, but then you have a correction to this, like, like uh, you know, depending on what scale, one over T, or, uh -huh. I mean, in your work, I mean, it's only the leading term which is important, or, or also the correction? So let's see here, can you clarify correction to which term? Well, I mean, you look at just the, you know, look at the, the motion of total, particles and you wait for a long time mm -hmm. I mean, then mm -hmm. you know the leading term will be t times uh, you know the, the eigenvalue and then there will be an order one correction yeah and it's so that I, correction I, which sort of um I, let me think about that i in a sense i think what we're arguing is that the correction doesn't matter I think that we spend most of our time really arguing that we can we can ignore it, and it's the the asymptotics of Moser is really what determines the main contribution, or that the time spent getting into that asymptotic regime is lower order. Moser proves an interesting theorem about the corrections. You see, that's sort of his main theorem in some sense. I mean, right, right. Yeah, I don't think we need that. Yeah. Other questions. Is there any kind of analog for non-symmetric matrices? Let's see. I, so the, the closest thing I'm, I'm aware of, so the QR algorithm, which is also integrable, it is at integer multiples of time, there's a flow that interpolates the iterates of the QR algorithm, and that applies to non-symmetric matrices. Yes, I had this in mind, so I was wondering. Yeah, so I, I, I honestly don't know, and maybe somebody else does, if there's an analog of TOTA that kind of upper Hessenberg elizes, um, or you can apply to upper Hessenberg matrices, um, right, because you, you know, because you're, you're gonna run, so if you run a general non-symmetric matrix, and this, you can't expect to get a upper triangular matrix because you're, you're not going to get complex stuff coming in. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And so in interest of time, let's yeah, go to the next you. speaker. Thank you very much. You could just um, share your screen. Thanks, Shane.